Teeth. Grand Portage reminded us of the main fur trade route from Montreal up the Ottawa River and across the Georgian Bay and west on Lake Superior to Grand Portage. A trip which took from six to eight weeks and involved nearly a thousand miles of paddling. From Grand Portage, the voyageurs went further west through the tangled lake and river country of the Quetico, up through the Lake of the Woods to Winnipeg. We all had two jobs to do, carry and paddle. And we soon found out what carrying was. We carried all canoes and gear over the Grand Portage, and this was eight long miles accompanied by swarms of mosquitoes and black flies. It's extreme heat. Some of the crew were not expecting such hardships. The Portage started at the foot of Partridge Falls and up over a height of land. Real tough going the first day. Everybody was anxious to get these rapids in the portage behind us. To prevent fatigue and paddling, we switched sides every 30 strokes. Everybody gets up early on a canoe trip. The mosquitoes make sure of that. We paddled five miles up Pigeon River and walked our canoes for another eight miles in waist deep water. The current was running up to 15 miles an hour in the rapids, and the stream bed was covered in boulders. We arrived at the Foul Lake Portage, which was a mile and a half of upgrades. It was nine o'clock when we got to sleep on an island free of mosquitoes. Before going to bed, we had a meal of stew and a mug of hot coffee. I was glad we decided to bring stew instead of the salted pork or pemmican the voyageurs ate. You can carry authenticity too far. Up in the morning, had difficulty keeping in stroke and we're not making very good time couple of days, the boys' hands were pretty soft, not used to steady paddling, and a few blisters were collected. Now, there's not much room in a canoe for legs and piles of gear, and the paddlers complained of leg cramps, sitting and paddling all day. into the forest went almost unnoticed, for our paddles were quiet, and we were working too hard to speak. By this time, all the paddlers realized the importance of a steady rhythm. This was perhaps the reason the voyageurs sang their songs and timed their with the tune. Getting into fast water again, we decided to land and carry our gear up the portage. Mm -hmm. 
These trails are worn smooth in many places, the rocks having been worn down by the feet of many Indians and voyageurs who have been going over them for centuries. When it's dry, this is a good trail. Six men can carry a north canoe without much trouble. By ducking your head under the hull, you can shift the weight to your other shoulder if you start to get tired. Breaking camp in the morning, the important job of loading a canoe is the responsibility of the bowman. From experience, he's learned to balance the canoe to make steering easy. With the canoes packed, we pushed off on another lake, ready to tackle the next portage. in for sure. When coming into shore, the bowman starts to back paddle and then the rest of the crew do a side stroke to draw the canoe into the shore. This one was pretty well over with young shrubs. It's no problem for the boys carrying the packs, but it was really rough going carrying those big canoes. No canoeman likes to get the bottom of his canoe scratched by bushes or rocks. It's like keeping the shine on your automobile. Turning the canoe over at Portage is done carefully to avoid damaging the hull. occasion, all five canoes came for this portage and camping spot at the same time. This a certain amount of confusion. Usually we were far enough apart to stay out of each other's way. Haversacks are emptied out for the evening meal. Everybody had a job to do when we hit camp. We had um, wood gatherers, fire makers, boys getting to be real woodsmen. Some boys gather driftwood to start the cook fire. The fire does two jobs, cooks the food and smokes out the mosquitoes. Le fils du roi, 
We built our fires near the canoes where we slept, good on a chilly night. But the last man up always put out the fire for safety. Up at 5.30 in the morning, but not too early for the deer. By 6.30, breakfast was over and we were loading the canoes for an early start. We spent a whole day shooting rapids, running 10 sets in 20 miles. The in our canoe directed our steering in the first rapids. We negotiated two sharp bends, fully loaded, paddling twice as fast as we usually did to try and fight our way out in this fast water rather than unload the canoe. Sometimes you make it, sometimes you don't. Both canoes paddled hard, doing 80 strokes a minute. We forced our way into the rapids. and uh, we didn't make it. The canoes swung around in the fast water, nearly overturning. With the bowman doing a side stroke to bring the bow around in the fast water, we kept upright, going sideways out of the rapids. We drove back out of the rapids and pulled to land to portage our canoes. We finally approached the height of land. From here, the waters flow to the Arctic instead of the Atlantic. Here, we carried out a ceremony traditional with the voyageurs. Our canoe captain spoke men with water flowing to the Arctic. At the same time, the men promised never to let another man pass this point without a similar ceremony. And they also promised never to kiss a voyageur's wife without permission. Following this ritual, we had a tot of high wine and set off again. High wine is concentrated alcohol, which the voyageurs carried for trading purposes, but it also made portages seem easier somehow. It had been raining, but within a short time, the sun came out again and a high wind gave us a chance to try out our sail. Sailing canoes was always traditional. The voyageur would sooner sit the sail than paddle. With this wind, our canoe flashed down the lake doing about 15 knots. It takes strength and skill to move these huge canoes to the water at a steady seven to eight miles per hour. And by this time, our paddlers were experts. In fact, the competition was fierce between the different crews to see who was first to hit the next beach. finally made it to Curtain Falls, a very fast stretch of water. In no way can you run Curtain Falls. And once again, we portaged around this wild stretch of water. The force of the water shoots spray high into the air. The men took the canoes and geared down the portage trail alongside the rapids.
Sometimes we carried the canoe right side up, especially when the portage was rough. We launched the canoes below the falls and the bowman started doing a side stroke to line up the canoe with the current. It's up to the bowman to steer the course around eddies and whirlpools. These are dangerous spots. He must always be on the alert. The steersman always watches the bowman's action to determine which way he's going to swing the canoe. It was not often that the day was clear enough for us to see our reflection in the water, but today was such an occasion. We often paddled at night in order to keep up to our schedule. Along the portage trails, the men often stopped to pick blueberries, as we had to live off the land and to conserve the food we carried. The variety of edible plants and fruits that nature provides is almost limitless, if you know what to look for. More rapids came up between and Saganaga Lake. We made it around two sharp bends, fully loaded, and flashed through into quieter water, feeling very exhilarated by the experience. In the distance, we saw the great high rocks of Lake La Croix in Quetico Park, where the Indian pictographs have been on the rocks for centuries. This artwork was done by some unknown tribe of Indians using natural dyes. It's amazing that these paintings have lasted for so many centuries. storm front was moving across the lake and we began to search for a landing. As 
As we set up camp, we stretched a tarp down from a canoe in the same manner that the voyageurs used to do in setting up their camp. The canoe has turned over the high bow and stern hold it up to provide a roomy shelter beneath. After a long day, strong coffee goes down very well. If you're going to rely on your tools to see you through the trip, then it's a wise voyageur who keeps them in good condition. Finally, the boys roll under their canoe for the night. Another day, and another portage. Their flesh and legging bands were worn to help prevent strangulation hernias, which caused many a fatality to the early voyageurs. under the hot sun, especially when it's combined with the exertion of paddling. So we were fed a daily ration of salt tablets. The canoes formed up close together and paddled down the lake, a friendly competition. Lake Winnipeg and checked the wind. It was blowing at gale force, 40 miles an hour and waves running six feet high. We got two canoes in the water, but they were swamped before they got 200 yards out. The canoes crested a wave with their bows high out of the water. The boys got dunked, but saved their canoes. And we all decided to wait until the wind went down before proceeding. evening for the leg of our trip to Fort Garry, 15 miles up Lake Winnipeg and another 10 miles up the Red River. The fort is the oldest stone-walled trading post in North America, restored some years ago. Crews were glad to be within sight of the fort. We landed our canoes on the beach, carrying them up to the fort where we were greeted by a couple of redcoats. Here we were met by the commandant of the fort, along with representatives of the Hudson Bay Company, who welcomed us as the first party to reach Lower Fort Garry. Several thousand spectators were on hand to witness the arrival of the brigade, where a great fur trading ceremony was reenacted. There had been hard times during our three-week journey. There were many good times, too. It made me realize how much courage and determination it took when the first voyageurs set out for the West. Just to be married, I could. 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 Just to be married, I could.